everyone. Welcome back after a long, long break. Um, sorry, it's been a fair amount of time since the last interview. The last one we did was Jan Russ, so you've not missed any since then. Uh, new baby. Not really had the time to try and find the people to do it or to actually sit down and do them on top of work. Um, but things are they're not starting to calm down at all, if I'm honest, but I'm finding the time at least. And what a first person back to have in Stefan Dennis. Um, Paul Robinson himself. Uh, Paul joined the show in 1985, right at the beginning, left 92. Returned briefly in 93 and then emerged from the flames of Blasters at the end of 2004. And he's still here today. Uh, the first cast member that we're doing who's currently still in the show. Um, and just to get this off the bat right away, there is no point in saying to me after you've watched this, oh, you should have asked him about this, Joe. Why didn't you? Because there's thousands of things that I should have asked. Um, but I'm so happy that Stefan's agreed to come back on again. Um, so we're just trying to find a time to be able to do that now. And then we can ask a lot more of them. I'll probably still miss a billion things. That's what happens when someone's been in the show for as long as Stefan has. And there's so many other things I want to talk to him about that he's done outside of Neighbours too. So, um, yeah, looking forward to having him back. So this is just part one. Uh, Lucinda Cowden, who plays Melanie, um, she is coming to do an interview with us next month, hopefully. Um, either way, that's happening. We just don't know when, but it'll be coming soon. That will be a really fun one, I'm sure. Um, but enough of me talking now. Here's me talking some more, actually. But Stefan Dennis talking too. So um, enjoy Hit like, hit subscribe, and come back for part two. I'm good, mate. More to the point, you must be absolutely knackered. How old's uh, your, your wee one? He is four and a half months. Just coming up to five months, actually, now. Oh, so he's a, he's a lockdown baby. You guys are all okay out there now, aren't you? You're all out of lockdown and everything. Yeah, yeah. Now, we're, we're you know, we're certainly not, but we're almost COVID-free over here. I mean, we... Um, we had, I think, one new case in the last week, which was from an overseas visitor. Yeah, and they, they, they sort of go straight into lockdown as soon as they hit the country, as soon as they get into the airport. You guys are doing it much better than we have over here. Oh, yeah, and that's why, you know, a year into it, we were, uh, you know, we, we were pretty much COVID-free a month ago, but then we had a couple of little scares, and rather than saying, oh, you know, it'll go away, they just the government just jumps on it immediately. And uh, with Melbourne went into a little mini five-day lockdown. I think Perth went into a five-day lockdown a, a couple of weeks before that. So they're not they're not taking any chances at all, which is it's great because it means we're you know we're pretty pretty free to move around and and do uh, most things freely now. That's great. I mean, yeah, we see you touching other people on screen, and we're like, wow, what's that like? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that's still very it's still very regulated. We're um, we're under very, very, very strict rules uh, at the studios where, because uh, you know, we were the first production company, drama production company to go back to work. And we, yeah, we that was amazing. The, yeah, yeah, we set the pace for every other production company in the world to go back to work with COVID, um, work in a COVID safe way. And we, um, but we're, we're still working under that protocol, even though the rest of the, the of Australia is sort of walking around fairly free. We, we still have to wear masks both inside the studios as well as outdoors as well. Uh, as, as long as we're on the compound, we have to wear masks. Um, we're all temperature checked. We, before we even get in the, into the building, we have to have a security check uh, make sure the security guard makes sure that we're wearing a mask before we proceed, before he'll even lift the barrier. Um, and then we have to drive up to reception where we're met by the nurse who temperature checks us and uh, checks our, our uh, pass. We have a government pass each day to be able to actually go into the building and work, which has to be filled out by us every morning. And she checks that. And, and only then we're allowed into the building. And when, once we're in the building, we have to follow fairly strict guidelines. Oh, it's a very different world, isn't it, to just over a year yeah, ago? Yeah, yeah. And if, if there's any intimacy, any touching or anything, we have a, a, a safety officer, if you like, on set, and they, they sort of, they just check and make sure, and if anybody touches anything or anybody, they, they, there's a whole uh, disinfectant process goes on after that. Wow, well, not, plus side, it looks like we're coming out the other side of it, which is quite nice. Um, right, so... Well, interview wise normally i have to do a little prep and i'll sort of mark down the highlights of a character and be able to go through it that way but i don't need to with paul because there's not enough time in the world to go through all of paul's <laughs> highlights so i'm not gonna run out of any anytime soon um but i guess <laughs> right back to the beginning it's probably the best place to start was it late 1984 what do you remember about first starting on neighbors or first going to the job on neighbors because you didn't want to do it originally did you no, no, and that, you, you were right. That was 1984 because I was actually cast in 1984, um, and we started in January '85. Started filming, um, 
No, and I didn't. It's, I mean, it's a well-worn story, but I'll go over it again. It's uh, basically my agent uh, had me up for three things. There was a play, a movie, and Neighbours came along third. And I was gunning for this play, because, uh, sorry, the, the film, um, because it was about the Australian light horse and the character I was playing was a, uh, a soldier in the light horse. And mm. I, I just felt that this part was completely mine because I'd trained with, uh, with Graham, Maff Graham Maffrick, who's one of the greatest animal trainers and uh, horse uh, riding trainers in Australia. And oh. he, uh, he trained me for the miniseries of The Flying Doctors because I was playing a rodeo rider on that and I had, he had to make me look like I'd been riding a horse since I was about three years old. So because of that horse training, I, and uh, along came this film, The Light Horse, and I was like, wow, this is me, this is my part, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get it. And every, I, I think every day I was reading my agent going, have they, have they given an arse yet? Have I got the film? Have I got the film? <laughs> and in the meantime, um, Neighbours came up. She said, oh, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a new soap opera. And I, mean, I, you know, I was a young thespian and I was like, I don't want to do a bloody soap opera, that's stupid, so a real actor. <laughs> and, and, and I said, I want the movie, I want the movie. And if that doesn't happen, I want the play. And I don't want to do a stupid bloody soap opera. Anyway, long story short, we, we sort of got down to the crux and they wanted me and, and said, uh, and I said, oh, have I got the film? And she said, no, they still hadn't given an answer. And she said, look, I'd, I'd go with the bird in the hand. And I said, I don't want it, I don't want it. And she said, well, just give it a go. And I said, all right, I'll do it for three months. By then I'll know if I'm going to do the film or not. And she said, well, they, you can't do three months. They want you for at least six months. To which I said, all right, I'll do six months. It won't even last that long anyway. Stupid <laughs> bloody show. And the, the irony was I was actually almost right because um, the, the, it actually only lasted seven months at, at Channel 7. Oh, yeah. Was that. And then, yeah, so I was almost right. But uh, little did I know it was going to turn into not only the, the greatest uh, drama serial Neighbours ever had, but uh, don't tell home in a way I said that. Um, but also, <laughs> they won't be a thing. <laughs> but also, you know, it... it completely changed my career path completely and what a good what a good direction it took me in though yeah no 100 as i said there's other things apart from neighbors i want to try and talk to you about because you did another role that i really really liked you in as well um when yeah. you um obviously you were a bit apprehensive about going into a soap how was it on day one when you got that script and you saw you were being dressed as a baby drunk in a door was it kind of like okay i was right not to want to do this or there's enough time no to no by that stage i was actually quite excited about it because by, by the time we were going to uh, into production uh I'd, I'd heard that i hadn't got the role in the film and the play had bitten the dust so i was kind of my age ah. was right when she said you know take the bird in the hand um and the and the other irony is is the uh the film ended up being i think I think it's Australia's greatest sort of big budget box office flop. Um, wow. And, and look at what happened with Neighbours. Yes, yeah, it's, awesome it's flop. Ironic what happened with both of those. But um, yeah, so it, it, as I was saying, so I think by day one and, and by the time I got the script, because the other thing was I, I went along and I auditioned for the part of Shane Ramsey. Oh, okay. And I read Shane Ramsey and then I got a call back. And they said, are oh, you reading for the part of Des Clark? And I went, okay, so I read Des Clark. And then a couple of days later, my agent said, right, we've got the part. And I went, oh, fantastic, great, playing Des Clark. And then these the, uh, scripts arrived at my, uh, at my door, uh, sent, by the, sent in the post, arrived at my door, and, uh, and I opened them up, it was Paul Robinson. I said, who the fucking hell is Paul Robinson? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I can't yeah, imagine you so, as Des. No, no. And... Again, thank God I got Paul Robinson because look what happened with that character. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think for the best way because we're talking here up until sort of just before kind of modern day at the moment. So I'm trying to think of the best way to kind of get through the eras, and I think the best way is to do it by wives because um, yeah. that kind of gets us through it. So that starts us with Terry, um, and yeah, yeah. we've spoken to Maxine, and she is a character. Um, she was great fun to speak to. Um, Paul and Terry. Do you think Terry was? really the main catalyst for what's happened to Paul today for who he's become I, I yes yes probably that was the thing that put you know put Paul's thinking into a different uh, a different place and, and a much darker place because of course he was shot by Terry and, yeah. and he, he's, he had his heart broken by Terry and 
he was lied to by Terry and deceived and all of that. So yes, all of that built up and then, and then her finally shooting him um, because he, he was trying to convince her to go to the police to turn herself in and she didn't want to. She was scared naturally. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it was in, in hindsight, that definitely was the turning point or the, the, you know, the change in, in Paul's thinking and his attitude towards life and the people in it. Um, but it, it was kind of a slow burn though. I mean, uh, Rosemary Daniels was, uh, was the, the, the catalyst in, the, um, in, his, in his actual career move. Yeah, business I think, sense. Uh, you know, his, his way of thinking was, um, that was uh, promoted by Terry and what happened with Terry. But I think he's actually, his career and his, his, um, his megalomaniacal approach to taking over the world was, uh, was stemmed from Rosemary giving him the, the uh, benef benefit of running the Daniels Corporation in Australia. That's all but Joy was, Chambers' fault. As, but as you rightly say, it was what happened with Terry and sort of that behind it that, that drove him to become the, the ruthless businessman that he was, not just, you know, a clever businessman. Because there was that amazing scene with um, yourself and Anne Haddy where Paul's sort of saying to Helen, that's it, I'm not going to, I'm not interested in, in love again, I'm just going to do business, like I'm not going to get hurt again. And he was very, very firm in it. And it seems like that has kind of become his mantra as he's gone on, is that it takes a lot for Paul to open himself up, I think. Yeah, yeah, I did. It took a while, and and that's why you know he left the university and joined the airline, and that's when it all that's that's when his life started really changing. When he he decided to chuck in uni and go to go and become a, a an airline steward, mm. um, and that's where kind of the strife started as well. But because uh, it was actually it was all very uh, very carefully plotted by Reg Watson, bless him, and myself, and uh, and the producers at the time. I remember Reg calling me into his office uh, one time after I'd finished in studio. I thought, oh, God, here we go. He's going to give me the pink slip here. <laughs> See you later, goodbye. <laughs> I know I'm a bit green, but Jesus, they give me a break. <laughs> and uh, and he, he said, oh, I want to sit down. He said, I want to, I want to sit down with you and just plot where we can take Paul. I'd, I'd like to take, I'd like to, you know, put, take Paul in a different direction so there's a bit more longevity. And I was like, oh, okay, fair enough. And, and I do, we sat there for about three hours just, you know, working out things that we could uh, do to take Paul in the direction that he is now followed all these years. Do you think Reg would be happy with where Paul is now, with the sort of man he is sort of in 2021? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I think Reg, Reg, I think Reg was very pleased, you know, right up until he died. He, you know, Neighbours was his baby, even though he'd mm. uh, written a lot of and created a lot of other shows. Neighbours was... I, I think it was always always had a very very special place in his heart, and I think you know any characters that uh, were developed by the actors and and the directors and producers, but developed by the characters uh, into a way that made them more likable uh, for the audience, more interesting for the audience in the show. I, I think he would only be anything but pleased and proud. And I think I, I definitely think the uh, the way the journey that uh, I've taken and the producers have taken Paul on. Um, I, I think Reg should be very uh, smiling, very happily in his grave at the moment. So we get to the end of 1985. Paul gets shot. And yep. while he's in the hospital, the show gets cancelled. Then it gets yep. brought back in on another, another network. What was? Yep. Do you remember much about that time of like what's going on? Because everybody we've spoken to have said they didn't really know what was happening. All of a sudden they were just going back. Well, I, I it's, it was a little more sort of definite for me because I, rather than being here and going, oh, okay, you know, you, oh, sorry, you've been out of work for a couple of mo uh, months. Um, well, we're going to start it up again. Um, I was actually overseas because of what had happened at Channel 7. Um, myself and my wife at the time, my first wife, Ros, were, uh, we decided that we were going to not, not sell up and, and bugger off indefinitely, but we decided to take the opportunity to go over and see Europe and, and, and do it, in, you know, when I say indefinitely, you know, for an extended period of time yeah. rather than just going over for a couple of weeks holiday or a month's holiday. So we kind of initially took out about six months and we did sort of sell things. I think I sold, we sold our car at the time to pay for the airfares and all of that. And, um, and we did, we, we did the classic uh, Australian thing and bought a combi van and started touring around Western Europe with a friend of ours who was also Australian, but she lived over there. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And I, I can't remember where I was. I think it was in Germany at the time when somehow my agent got hold of me. I, and of course, you've got to remember this is the days, well, we had faxes then, but it was certainly the days before mobile phones and, and uh, the internet and being able to get hold of people easily. So to this day, I, I, I fail to remember how she actually got hold of me, but she did and, um, and managed to uh, say that the, the Channel 10 had picked it up and would I be interested? But the, the funny thing was that at exactly in the same phone call, she said, but there's another thing, um, Crawfords are picking up uh, Flying Doctors and they're going to uh, run with a series. This, uh, this is after I've done the mini series. And she ah. said, they'd like to back as well. <laughs> so I was said, that a choice you had? And I said, so is that to reply, reprise the character of young Doug, who I played in, in Flying Doctors? And she said, yeah, yeah. And I said, oh, I'd much rather do that. And she said, well, um, you might want to think about this. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, neighbours want you indefinitely. And she said, at the moment, Crawford's only want you for the first three episodes. And I said, I think I'll take neighbours, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the time I'd, I'd learned to love neighbours. So the idea of going back to it. So, yeah, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't the same as what it was seven months prior to that or eight months prior to that when I was going, oh, I don't do soaps, darling. <laughs> it's like, give me the soaps. Um, so moving on to so I'm while I'm working during the day I'm actually rewatching Neighbours from the start because I, I'm that much of a loser. You poor bugger, um, my god! <laughs> and where I've got to at the moment is Gail. So Paul and Gail have just I, done their business geez, deal. Long way to go. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Many years. They've done their business deal. Um, they've all got back together. They've had a big barn dance in the waterhole about it. Talk to me about Gail because that was for a lot of people that's still the the relationship. Paul is Paul and Gail. Yeah, yeah it, it is, and I think you know it's, it's unfair. It's unfair to talk about the others because I think all of Paul's wives. Are, one, I loved working with the actresses. I never had. I, I don't think I. You know, I can say a bad thing about any of the actresses that that I worked mm. with who played my my, my uh, girlfriends and wives. Um, but Paul. It, as I say, even though he, uh, he, you know, he he obviously fell in love with all these women, otherwise he wouldn't have married them. Um, but he, I, I think, to this day, um, and it's it's people will debate it, but I think to this day, um, Gail has always been Paul's great love, and yeah. she was she, even though he married Terry, Gail was his first real true love, um, and she was the first one waving, think, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, and they, they met in the airline, and they uh, they you know they had very similar things, they, similar um, ways of thinking, and she, Gail was very 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 forgiving, um, but she she helped steer Paul um, completely back to him until very I mean there's a very similar relationship with Gail as what there is with Therese because I was yes. going to say Therese would be the, you know the next. Uh, one true love of Paul's. I think that the, the characters of Gail and Therese um, are definitely the two strongest and best wives from Paul. Well, it's interesting um, they're both businesswomen, whereas yeah, yeah, the other ones they haven't really Paul been. Run, exactly, they both helped Paul run the business. Um, yeah, and, and that's probably another reason why they, they got on so well, why Paul and, and Gail and Paul and Therese get on so well, um, is because they you know, have similar like-mindedness there. Um, but they're just, yeah, and I think it's all about, I think the women who survive best with Paul are those who tolerate him, understand him and love him passionately. And I think that's what's, that's what's happened. And, and, and they get that love in return, even though Paul's a grumpy old bastard these days. <laughs> he's still, you know, he, he, he definitely returns the same love that he gets from Therese, for example. He is, and I think uh, the, they stand up to him a lot more as well, I think, to raise him. Yeah, himself. yeah. And we all know Paul, you know, since he's matured, he's, Paul loves a woman, he'll stand up to him. He'll love any person that stands up to him, but particularly women, you know, he's got no time at all. I, I remember there was a scene with uh, uh, an actress called Alin, a wonderful actress who uh, played a receptionist and she'd sort of, uh, I think it was a first day or something, and Paul... Paul was in between, and I can't remember if it was when he was trying to decide about Therese or there's something going on with Therese and they was, you know, they were a part of this before they'd actually got together properly. And yeah. there was always that, are they on, are they off, are they on, are they off, are they on with Therese, which is what we wanted that. We actually um, took that to, to the producers and asked for that specifically. We said, well, we don't well. want the, we, we, 
yeah, we, we said, we want you to put up, we know, you know, in, in good old soap fashion that you're eventually, if the characters work, that you're eventually going to want to marry them. But we said, we want you to put that off for us absolutely as long as possible. And they did bless them. They, they uh, respected that. And because and, I said, it, it makes Paul and Therese much more interesting when, not when they're at it, each other's throats, but when there's a bit of feistiness in the relationship. Yeah, um, they spar off each other really well. We were always worried that they would get married and just, you know, become boring. And fortunately, since we got married, we've said, look, you know, we want to continue. We don't want Paul and Therese to become boring. And, and they, they, again, you know, we've worked at that and the, the producers and directors have respected that. So it's been been good in that. And so, yeah, so it is. It is. It's the, the women who stand up to, well, sorry, I was saying that, the, 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 and so what the, the, I can't remember her character's name, but, um, and so Paul was kind of deciding whether he should be with Therese or whatever. And he's going, ah, I don't know, I should, I can go and get any women I like. And he, and he tested it. And he's, he said of this girl, and he's, he said, the young, pretty young thing that was a receptionist in his hotel. And he said, so how are you settling in? And yes, yes, it's lovely. And she was a bit starry eyed. And he said, would you like to come up to my penthouse? There's a beautiful sunset view over the city and we can have some wine. And she's like, yes, yes, that'd be fantastic. That'd be lovely. Or doughy eyed. And he sort of looked at her and just went, yeah, maybe another time. <laughs> it was too easy. She was, and, and he was like, no, I want a bit of a fight. I want, I want the challenge. I want the, the chase. Yeah. He does. Yeah. Paul definitely needs the challenge. So yeah. Gail was the 80s, which was, um, I guess you could still call it peak neighbours. It was when it was at its biggest um, in the mid 80s. Yeah. 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 We, we, yeah. Um, Fee and I worked, we did, I think it was 19. She joined at the very end of 80s. Six or eight yeah. or seven, I think, when Gail came into it. Um, and uh, yeah, and that was definitely, that was the the absolute phenomenal period, the highlight of the, the hysterical, hysterical period of Neighbours. It's the, the Beatle mania, wasn't it? But for Neighbours. Yeah, yeah. And it literally was, you know. And I mean, when I say it now, this, you know, particularly to the younger generation, I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. But, you know, back then, you'd say it to people and they'd go, oh, don't be silly. And it's like, no, honestly, no word of a, a lie. We are, there was no difference to what happened to us as to what happened with, you know, the biggest boy band at the time or the Beatles. Mm. Uh, we were chased down the street. We were hounded. We were, uh, you know, we, could, we, could, we couldn't walk out the front door for fear of paparazzi hiding in the bushes or whatever. It was yeah, was it was that in normal. Australia and when you visited the UK? No, way. not Australia, but we're, we're far more laid back here. <laughs> yeah, our tabloids. But, yeah, <laughs> we, we never had the... Or, or very, very rarely, probably the only time we had hysterical recognition was at actual organised events, like if we did big shopping centres where um, the shopping centres were never prepared, they, they would, uh, they'd say, oh, there's a neighbour's appearance this Saturday at such and such a Westfield shopping centre. And they would make preparations for, you know, maybe about 500 people turning up. And then they'd be out of their minds because 10,000 would turn up. Um, That's insane. Or, or, we, we were giving away a house as a, a competition um, and they had, again, they had the whole cast of Neighbours up at, at Brisbane for this big competition, Channel 10 competition that they did, mm. uh, whereby they won a house and they took us up there. And again, they thought, you know, they thought that was going to be pretty big and they thought, oh, there'll probably be about 5,000 people will turn up for that, for the, the live gig for the, for the, uh, to see Neighbours. Well, 50,000 turned up. That's crazy. And, you know, they, they had to start getting all sorts of police control and everything. And I've had the same thing in Europe. I remember a, a, uh, a time over in the uh, uh, Belfast, which the constabulary weren't very, very pleased about because there was this two, two Bob actor from uh, Melbourne. And basically they had to pretty much shut down the centre of Belfast <laughs> because of it. Because I was, I was appearing at the BBC shop there in the, in the plaza in Belfast. And Absolutely. I remember them all, all the police and all the security guys and scratching their heads, just going, how the feck are we going to get this guy out of this building? They did not know. And they were talking about landing a helicopter on the top. They were talking about, anyway, in the end, <laughs> they sort of made a police cordon where they all linked arms to make a human chain to keep the people back so that the, the um, car could come out, they could open the loading Bay at the back of the shop and the car came out and sort of it, it was like the presidential you know cavalcade sweeping through yeah. this crowd of thousands of people who just kept turning up um, with the police amazing. you know literally holding them back linked linked arms and you, you know, did the role like right it just it sounds unbelievable but it happened 
you did the Royal Variety Show as well, didn't you? I did that in 88, yeah. 88, how was that? That must have been, that's a beautiful well, theatre. You know, it's just like, it, that was, we could never understand that. We could not, we could literally not understand. I mean, we were happy as Larry and we were over the moon that we had been invited by the Royal family to come and perform in the, in the Royal Gala performance, uh, Royal Variety performance. But um, we, we kind of went, why? We just... We, you know, we're two Bob actors from a little soapy in Melbourne, for goodness sakes. And, you, it's, and, and we were the stars of the show. And you, you know, had your Cliff Richards and your buddy Ronnie, the two Ronnies, and the, uh, like, no, I don't think the two Ronnies were there that night, actually, no, but, but you know, all these really big names, um, British names. And there were these, as I say, this bunch of scraggly actors from the soapy and thing. And we were being revered. And, and I always remember the, um, the the queen mum because it was the queen mum and princess margaret were at the night and queen mum was the a big queen fan mom, yeah she was an avid fan both her and diana were, were avid fans they used to actually get uh tapes sent over from the bbc if they missed episodes can you hang on three <laughs> seconds Joe? Hang on. What's going? no it's just my cat trying to get in and then decide she doesn't want to little bugger oh, i literally um, just had the same thing and, with my dog i had to get up and close the door yeah. <laughs> so she comes up and she sits and waits at the at the glass door there and waits and waits and waits and then you get up you open the door and she just sort of looks you and then walks out and walks the other way <laughs> thank you for your time i'm off now <laughs> arrogant yeah arrogant little bugger um but yeah no the the, the queen that's right because it was banana rama there was kylie and uh, I think Banana Rama and then myself and Anne Hattie and, and neighbours, Anne and I were sort of standing at the front and everybody around. And then there was somebody else and Cliff Richard and the Golden Girls from America that the, uh, mm. the comedy uh, showed Golden Girls. They were, they were the international artists. They, they were supposedly the big name uh, for the night. Um, yeah, they, they were supposedly the big draw card, the American show Golden Girl. And, and we ended up overshadowing them and, and not, you know, not intentionally. Excuse no, me, it just worked. I and, think it was the um, timing, wasn't it? Because we had Scott and Charlene's yeah. wedding must have been around that time. Well, yeah, it was. Uh, no, it was after that. But anyway, so um, the Queen Mum, she's talking to Anne Hattie and, and I, say, oh, hello, hello, lovely to meet you. It's lovely. Thank you very much for coming over. And then she'd move on. That was all. And she'd moved on. And then she moved on. And she was talking to the Golden Girls. And I swear, it was literally, she must have been mid-sentence. And she just stopped. And talking to them, and came back to Anne Hattie and I, and said, "So come on, come on, let tell me some secrets. What's happening in neighbours?" We're like, "What the fuck? This That's is so amazing." <laughs> Queen Mum asking me, unbelievable. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, we need to get out of the eighties. So we've only got half an hour left on a lot of balls, and we could literally speak That's for sixteen right. hours and not cover it. Um, early nineties is where you. Um, that is where my favourite pool was actually. The early nineties. I think you had some of your best storylines at that point, but one of them. And I've mentioned this to Jason Herbertson. I've mentioned this to Shana Shiva a lot that I really want this character back is Glenn Donnelly. Because that was a really yes. interesting relationship between Paul and Glenn that I think is really unresolved. I think there's a lot of potential for some. Yes, yes. Because when, when he fell off the roof, I'm trying to ascertain, did he become a, pla a paraplegic or yes. was it... He, he was permanently disabled, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. When he yeah. fell off the roof, he put, and then Paul tried to um, con him out of being able to... Off, yeah, yeah. yeah. Essentially, to, to bugger off, yeah, and that was after a lot of feuding between them because obviously the Glenn and Lucy thing, which in the UK we saw about 50% of. Um, but <laughs> yeah, what so do you think? How do you think they would get on now if they bumped, came back into each other's lives again, Paul and Glenn? Because that was one of his biggest rivalries. Of I, them. I think it would be uh, awkward, I think it would be abundantly awkward. Um, Simply because, as you said, you know, there's been no resolution. He pulled, and then, you know, Paul, I, I think uh, Glenn ended up not taking the money and just told Paul to piss off and he didn't want anything to do with him because he was not a very nice person. Um, yeah, and then he just yeah. disappeared. Pretty, like pretty much speaking. Pretty. Yeah, and so I think, I, I don't know, it's an interesting one because I think, I think, you know, it, would there be enough uh, time passed and maturity gained that the two men would sort of go... You know what? It's it is what it is, and that happened in the past. And you know, I think you're an okay bloke, and well, I think you're an okay bloke. So you know what? Or whether they would just, you know, I mean, Paul holds a grudge for goodness' sake. You know, he's a, even though he wasn't the one that really should hold the grudge, it should be Glenn that's holding the grudge. Yeah. But, um, but, but yeah, Paul, he loves to hang. He, he likes to hang on to things unnecessarily. 
Um, and he turns and he makes things all, it's funny, I was just watching John Cleese in Faulty Towers with my son before this interview. And oh, the thing that makes, yeah, yeah, the thing that makes Faulty Towers so brilliant is the fact that uh, Basil Faulty just keeps compounding it by, instead of just saying, the truth and going, oh, this is what happens. He tries to cover up all the time and he tries to, to, to make it something else. And that's what makes it so brilliant and makes yeah. the comedy work so well. <clears throat> and I think Paul's very similar, but without the comedy, he's, <laughs> you know, instead of just going, this is the way it is, I'm really sorry, I cocked up and such and such. He always tries to cover it up or he tries to buy his way out of it. And it just ends up inevitably making the situation 10 times worse. Yeah, and well, he, he doubles think, down, doesn't he? Yeah, you, you would think, you know, he would learn, but he never does. And, you know, even to the point where Therese says literally that, you know, you, you think that you, you can solve things by throwing money at it and, and you just never learn. And he goes, yes, oh, but I did this time. I've learned my lesson until the next time. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, until the next week and then he does it again. Because yeah. um, yeah. it's interesting that you left when you did from a creative point of view, I think, because the time when you did leave, which was, what, 92, wasn't it? I guess 92, mid-92, yeah. That was, I think Paul was at his strongest at that point. But you had some incredible storylines. There was Paul being suicidal, which is one of the rare times, yeah. perhaps only times we've seen that on Neighbours, where he was up on that bridge about to jump off. Yeah, um, well, that was, was when he was having his breakdown, when he was he thought he was losing everything. I mean, you know, it's very much like people who jump out of buildings in, in mm. massive recessions and things. And uh, Paul was pretty much the same. And it was he, he was having a, a mental and emotional breakdown. It was a full-on nervous breakdown as well, wasn't it? He? he was taken yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. I always remember the poor actor who uh, uh, there was that scene where uh, Paul trashes the office. Yes. And just before he does, he's he's uh, accusing the guy. I can't even remember who the guy was, what relationship it was, but something to do with business with Paul and Paul thumping him in the chest with his finger going, and you did this. And, this. <laughs> and I always remember saying to the guy, I said, you know, do you mind if I, you know, if I actually do physically poke you? And he said, no, no, go for it, go for it. <laughs> and I looked back at the scene, I thought, geez, I was jabbing him so hard. He must have had bruises on his chest, poor bugger. It was such yeah, crazy. Yeah, and that was just trash the office. Yeah. And then straight after that was the, um, I say affair, it wasn't really a full-on affair, was it? But there was the dalliance with Caroline while he was with Christina, who I guess we should probably get to as well now, actually, because that's yeah, which I, I really like. I think Paul was more, much more suited to Caroline than Christina, I think, because she was more of a Gail or Therese, wasn't she, Caroline, whereas Christina wasn't. So yes, that, yeah, exactly. She was, uh, um, Caroline was more business minded and all of that, whereas uh, Gail was more, uh, sorry, um, Christina was more homely and, and you know, motherly, etc. Mm. whereas Caroline was more the business one. But, um, and yeah, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. People used to say the same thing about me because I actually went out with Gail, uh, Gail and yes. I were relationship for about two years now the amount of people that used to say to me you sure you're with the right twin there Steph? <laughs> <laughs> you can't say this but yeah it's it's amazing how many people used to say and, and but the funny thing about it was is it was i think it was blown out of proportion the whole uh affair thing because it wasn't yeah, actually an affair at all all they did was they snogged um it was by accident I, I, at one time was, say that again it was an accidental snog as well, I think, the first time, wasn't it? He thought it was Christina laying on the sofa. Yes, or the yeah, other way yeah, around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then there was the real snog. But, the, but I think it's just the fact that, you know, it's, it's the question is, you know, what, what uh, warrants an affair? You know, is, is, mm. is it sex? Is it the fact that you think about somebody the wrong way or you, you, you snog them or whatever? And I suppose it's the fact that, you know, he, he was married to Christina and the person that he happened to be snogging was Christina's twin sister. So, yeah, I suppose that doesn't look too good on the old resume. And, I, and it, it probably didn't help as well that she found out via a baby cam as well. I think it was a baby monitor. That he, yeah, yeah that that's her. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was good fun. Um, but, yeah, you left shortly after that. So what prompted the decision to go? Was it just, I've done this for, what, seven years now? It's time to try new things? Yeah, it, it, it literally was, you know, but that, at that time I was still a fairly young actor and, uh, and, and I say young, you know, uh, um, physically young, but also, you know, young in the business. Yeah. And uh, I suppose by that stage I've been doing it for about you know, 13, 14 years or so professionally. And I thought, yeah, it's time for me to sort of kick this one to the side now and go and get another job. And I, I had aspirations of conquering the world in America and that unfortunately <laughs> the timing was wrong. I, I went over to America for a while, but I, I, 
I was there before the Australian invasion. So even though I'd sort of gone with this amazing credential under my belt, plus all the previous work I'd done before that, yeah. um, they just weren't interested in Australians at all at that time. And in the late eighties, early nineties, they well, they didn't well, know who we were and weren't and weren't interested. Yeah, and, and you know that changed dramatically. Um, but uh, so it didn't work there. And I, I I spent most of the time I was away in the UK, um, pretty much most of the time. I was there for over eleven years. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I because of neighbours, uh, I was very very fortunate, and I worked non-stop the whole time I was in the UK. The only time I didn't work as an actor was when I actually chose to, and I I uh, put on an independent. Uh, producers had film producers had for oh. four years um, and that was uh, that was a hell of a learning experience sent me broke and uh, but taught me an awful lot um, and it gave me much greater respect it, it was funny because it actually gave me a, a much greater respect for uh, my acting career by uh, by learning all about the other side of the camera you did go back to neighbors briefly didn't you in 1993 for uh, yeah, 93, I went back to two weeks was that always planned for you to go back for a brief spell or did they uh, just no, approach that, you because and no, again, that was uh, that was an invite back. I got a, an invite set because that was for the 2000th episode. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and that was just a two week. They asked me if I'd come back for a two week guest year's Paul, and they devised the storyline around it. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I think it was in New Zealand at the time when I did that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I was uh, I was able to do that. And then, uh, but that was it. Then I was like, okay, I've done neighbors. I don't. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do neighbours again. Um, and for, as I say, fortunately, I, I work non-stop in uh, Britain uh, and overseas as well. I was doing. Uh, I, we took Blood Brothers over to New Zealand and Australia. Um, but I it was predominantly theatre for the first six years I was there, and then as I was doing uh, producing, and then I uh, and then I decided I wanted to get back into acting and, and get back into TV and film. Um, and, and I did, and I, started, I marched straight back into it. I thought it'd be, because I'd had a, that high hiatus for four years, I thought it'd be a bit of a struggle, but I virtually got a gig straight away and then another gig, and then I worked uh, on Dream Team with Sky One for a year, and then... That's the one I wanted to talk to you about, uh, oh, Dream right. Team, because, yeah, you were the, then, the owner uh, of Harchester United, weren't you? Yeah, and then, and then my son was born, uh, and I, I didn't want to bring up a, a, a kid in London, no that disrespect to Londoners, but you know, coming no, no. from Australia, I, I, uh, I didn't want to bring up a child in London. So I said to Gail, come on, time for us to head back to Australia. Uh, and we were literally selling up and packing up to do that. And I got a, a, a call from BBC Scotland to do River City. So I did that for six months before we ended up actually going, finally going back to Australia. And what was Dream Team like? Because you were there for, for one year, weren't you? Because your character in that was, he was quite Paul Robinson-like. Like Paul Robinson, how yeah, very now. much, yeah. And the, and the thing about it is, it's like I, I remember, and that was one of the things why I said I wanted to get out of Neighbours the first time. I said because I don't want to be typecast. And now I'm actually quite happy to be typecast because you know, I more often than not I get uh, typecast as the villain or the or the you know the the almost villain. Um, yeah, they're strong roles. So, you know, even, even when I've done plays and things, I tend to get these days I get cast as the the nasty or the villain or whatever, which is great. Um, and you've been Peter Pan uh, as well, haven't you, from memory? Did Peter Pan, yeah, yeah. I vaguely remember uh, seeing you swinging across something while wearing the green. I think it was on one of the behind-the-scenes documentaries. Um, <laughs> right. Then you came back to the show, very end of 2004, like literally the very end of 2004. Like, yeah, yeah. How much did you know about what was going on? And what was it like to emerge from the smoke and the flames and have that massive uh, appeal? Well, I was literally, I mean, obviously the only thing that was familiar to me was Neighbours. Mm. Um, and I, by that, I mean, you know, the show was still the same. It had changed dramatically in its, uh, its visual appearance. Uh, it had changed dramatically in the way that the show was, or the studios were run, because by this time, of course, Channel 10 no longer existed out of the studios. Because when I was there the, the first time, Channel 10 was still housed out of the studios. That was the Channel 10 studio. So we still had all the whatever ch uh, shows Channel 10 were doing. Um, so we only had one one big studio then. And there was the news uh, team, was their studios up the front of the building. And, the, and it was a, a very vibrant building with, you know, five or 600 people in there at any given time. Um, to coming back to the studios where there was maybe, you know, 100 to 120 people in the, in the building. 
Um, and, and going from having just one studio to now, we've basically got the entire studio complex. We've got both of the main uh, uh, sound stages. We've got all the smaller studios. We've got the upstairs. Yeah, it's, bigger, isn't it? it's been converted into the hospital and stroke school. We've got all the back lot, which used to be the helipad for Channel 10 and the, the this, that and the other is that, you know, that's been uh, converted into the neighbor's back lot now, which we, we now boast, I, I didn't realize, but the neighbor's boast the largest um, Backlot in the Southern Hemisphere now. Wow, I didn't yeah. know that. That's yeah, yeah, that's pretty fact. interesting. Another, another accolade, yeah. Um, but we, uh, so yeah, so as I say, the, but the show itself was the thing that was familiar to me, but the only familiar face apart from crew, when I walked into the studio and saw the crew, it was like, shit, you guys are all still here. <laughs> <You> <laughs> Everybody know, says that, that, the crew stays say, the same. Oh, what are you doing here? Oh, you're still here. Oh, you're still here. It was like old home week. But the cast were completely different. The only person I knew was Smithy, Ian Smith. So, yeah. and bless him, Smithy took me under his wing straight away and, and you know, made sure that I was comfortable and, and re relaxed but coming back into the show and the, coming back in working in the studios. But I, I felt like I was a new kid on the block and it, it made me laugh because people were saying, oh, you know, your, your, your name is being whispered down the corridors. And I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? They said, oh, Stephen Dennis is back, Paul Robinson is back, and oh, oh whisper, whisper, and I'm like, oh, yeah, but, uh, I, I'm the one, I feel like I'm the new kid on the block, because I know nothing, I don't know it's, anybody here. Yeah. It would have just been, yeah, Ian Smith, I guess maybe slightly Tom Oliver, but then you only overlapped briefly on your first stint, so yeah, I guess it probably wasn't yeah, Howard, yeah. Didn't it? yeah, which is crazy, but did you... So you came back for it was a it was a spell, wasn't it? It was never going to be as long as it turned out to be. No, no, it was the same thing. They asked me to uh, reprise the character for a two week guest eat for the twentieth anniversary. <laughs> oh, well, that, that was definitely in, turned. That on, was but... in two thousand and four, and that's now two thousand twenty one. <laughs> it's a long twentieth anniversary celebration. It's, yeah, it's long, long, long two week gig. Yeah, longest two week gig in the world. They just kept saying, you know, would you stay? Two weeks went before the before it even started. The two weeks they said, would you do three months? And that became six months, and that became a year. And on it went. Yeah. Oh, that answers the question I was going to ask then, because I didn't know whether Paul had lost his leg before you knew you were going to be coming back permanently, and whether that would have perhaps changed. No, no, no that was that months. was all devised. That was because um, Paul, as you probably know, Paul is the only person that. I, I, that I can think of in Australian soap history and, and possibly world soap history, who's gotten away with, uh, you know, a principal character who's gotten away with uh, first degree murder and yeah. a, grand last, a grand arson. Um, and so the, the producers sort of, you know, two years on, they said, look, you know, the, the public is screaming out for re retribution for Paul. He, he's got to have some sort of retribution because he can't just get away with it, even though he's got away with it. Um, with the law and even though he tried to give himself up when he found out that what he'd done etc cetera, etc cetera, they said he, he's got to have some sort of moral retribution if you like and what we've decided to do is we're going to uh, we're going to cut off his foot <laughs> okay <laughs> so again not realizing that the gig was going to go on for 17 years no you don't um, get used to that and i'm thinking that oh foot. yeah right i can act without a foot for a year i suppose and, and then the foot became the leg. And there's a funny story as um, the, uh, Chris Anderson, who is our, um, our stunt coordinator and, stunt, uh, and head stuntman at the time, uh, he'd lost his leg in an accident when he was doing the film uh, about the America's Cup. Wow. And he lost his leg over, uh, in an accident, boating accident over in Perth during the filming. Um, anyway, the producers had actually said to him, look, you know, we're thinking of uh, chopping Paul's leg off. And would you mind terribly if we chopped it off just below the knee, like yours? And then if we ever need to do a cutaway of Paul's leg, would you be upset if we used it? And he's like, nah, that's fine, no worries at all. <laughs> so they went, right. So they Trooper. chopped Paul's leg off at just below the knee. And then three weeks later, Chris decided to move to Queensland. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So it didn't yeah. work out too well in the end. Um, there was also uh, the brain tumour, wasn't there? That was another thing done to try and... Yeah, reduce. and it's funny, you know, because the brain tumour, that was one of those stories that I, oh, guys, come on, really? Really? Tim Phillips was your imaginary friend, wasn't he? Fox. Yes, yeah, yeah, Tim Phillips, who was, who was Fox, who was basically, uh, it was the, the Fight Club scenario. Yeah. Um, you know, he, was, he had this imaginary friend that he thought was absolutely real and was convincing him to do this, that and the other, and... 
um, because it was all his imagination. And I, I that was one story that I, I did question and I thought, guys, come on, I think you've gone too far on this one. And then I actually started researching uh, aneurysms and brain tumours and all of that. And it's, it's actually true. You know, people can lose a great chunk of their life and their memory because of it and they and their personalities can completely change or they can you know they can suddenly uh, speak a language that they could never you know they never even thought about speaking before you know so really strange things happen um and so when i actually did that i went actually you know what no all right yeah i'll, I'll run with this um and it was a bit hard to play sometimes because it did seem a bit over the top but uh, and i think the I, I think the public probably at first thought the same as me and thought oh come on this is a far a bit far fetched it's, it's a bit like bobby ewing's uh, nightmare <laughs> yeah you know, it's like, oh, this, we're, we're going to justify 20 years of paul's life uh but, you know why he was bad all of this time but down to a brain tumor but yeah that's actually that's very very true they did that to try and make Paul a bit nicer, didn't they? Is to try and um, well, cut off yeah, some more that, edges. Well, that was the other thing because the the producers they thought right, okay, we've cut Paul's leg off, but the, the, he's he's still gotten away with it. We have to, we just can't have him being as nasty all the time because by that stage, I I built the character up to being deliciously evil. I used to describe him. I mean, the 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 the, the most fun time I think that I ever had on Neighbours was what I used to call the Izzy years, which was um, yeah. Matt Bassing who played Izzy and um, and Pippa Black who played Elle, my daughter on the show. And that was a the great three of us, whenever whenever the three of us used to work together, I used to just adore it. It was the most fun time I had because there was Izzy who was evil but had a heart of gold. Uh, there was Paul who was just malevolently evil and had such fun in being evil. And then there was his daughter who was trying to be, you know, the go between both of them being horrendously evil, but she got sucked up into it as well. And it was like, it was just fantastic. It was but, great. Um, but what happened? So, so, you know, and as the producer said, they, again, they called me in two years on after I'd come back, they called me into their, their office and they said, um, step, we don't know what to do here because this is the hardest thing we've ever had to do. We have to fire you for doing you, your job so well. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> they said, well, every single thing we've thrown at you, you've just taken it on board and run with it. And I said, well, yeah, I'm an actor. That's my job. That's what you pay me for. And they said, you know, you can. And I said, guys, guys you know, it's fine. I don't, don't, they would get really upset. And I said, it's fine. I said, I came back for two weeks and I've had two years. I'm pretty happy. Mm. Uh, of course, I wanted to keep by that stage, I wanted to keep going on, but uh, you know, I understood it. And they said, Yeah, we just, you know, it's the, the character's become too big for the show, he's become almost a caricature it, with his evilness. And uh, and I said, Okay, fine, fine. And anyway, uh, I, I don't know what happened. Somebody told me that they got the phone call from London saying, No, you don't get rid of Paul Robinson. Um, and anyway, Rick, the executive producer, came running up to me a few days later and said, Steph. I think I've devised a way to keep Paul in, in, in Neighbours. And I've gone, oh, great, okay, what's that? And that's when they came up with the whole brain tumour thing. Um, and they said, and what it'll do is it'll make Paul nice again. So, you know, it can be, it can be nice Paul Robinson and the public can have nice Paul Robinson. Well, it backfired on us horribly because I, I and I said to them, I said, guys, the, the public don't like Paul being nice. They, they, they like they like the nasty Paul and they were going like yeah yeah sure 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 and they thought I was just disgruntled because I was you know, <laughs> trying, you know playing something that I used to enjoy not sorry not playing something that I used to enjoy playing so well um and and I said no no look you've got to understand you know I'm at the front line I go out there and people people just accost me and say you know why isn't Paul bad we like Paul bad anyway eventually one night we were doing a big charity gig for the uh, I think it was for the bushfires appeal over here and uh and we had a very, very large audience. And, and Rick and Peter, the two, uh, the producer and the EP, happened to be in the audience. And I had the mic and I, I was in charge at the time. And they said, and, and I said, oh, just, you know, I'm talking to the audience. And I said, oh, just hang on, say, I said, folk. I said, I'm just going to run a little uh, test here. I said, hands up all those who like nice Paul Robinson. And about six hands went up. <laughs> and then I said, okay, who likes nasty Paul Robinson? And whoop, the entire audience their hands went up some people with two hands and i just turned to the producer and i said there's your answer guys yeah there you from go. that point on they were, okay right got to start making paul bad again so gradually over a space of about uh probably you know slow burn for a couple of years um in molding him back into being mr nasty again well i think he actually turned into his nastiest 
after that with Rebecca. With yeah, how that yeah. Relationship well, ended. That was really evil, Paul. So which one was that then? That was around the six thousand where Rebecca pushed you off the the Lasters mezzanine. That yeah, was, yeah, I yeah. I think yeah. Paul was his evilest then. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's he's done some diabolical things. You know, it's it's a it's no wonder he's had so many attempts on his life to get saved. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it's uh, astonishing that the man is still walking around and, and quite happily walking around and and it's just it's like <laughs> just, i mean i love the writing sometimes i absolutely love it sometimes we struggle with writing but bless them they do you know they work their asses off our writers and, and mm. hats off to them but sometimes you know they'll just paul will say the most cutting things and then just go about life again <laughs> he just doesn't care does he like he says it and then that's it's gone go on with what he was doing yeah it's, um, I'm going to get into some questions because we're quickly running out of time and say we've barely even scratched the surface, but I'm going to get into some questions that we've got in. One of them's from Paul that normally does this with me, but he's working this morning. Um, he wants yeah. to know how involved you were in Alan Dale becoming a Christmas bauble. <laughs> Which I, well, gone down I wasn't so much involved in it, but, but I loved it. I loved it. The fact that we were going to get Alan back on the show. And it was really funny because I'd seen him just uh, a, a couple of months before that. Um, uh, he was over here, and we, I remember I was being, uh, I was out to lunch with him. He he, uh, he told me what was happening. I said, "Yeah." I said, "What do you think?" And he said, oh, "I think it's funny as anything." He said, "I think it's brilliant." <laughs> Did Jim? Because because um, Alan left on a very sour note. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he did. But, uh, and he vowed that he'd never have anything to do with it. But I, I managed to talk him around. So I, 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 you know, the producers were sort of counting on me to, to try and talk Alan into it. But it didn't take much. Because, of course, you've got to really, the, the irony was Alan was the one that, that literally ended up talking me into coming back in 2004. Oh, was he really? Oh, that's full circle. Yeah, was, he, he was in the middle of that because I, 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 again, I thought it would be career suicide to come back after being away from the show for so long. And because I, all my work had been in the UK and a lot of it had been staged, of course, people over here didn't really know that I'd been working. So they probably thought I'd just, you know, an actor that had faded into oblivion after my stint on Neighbours. And, yeah. um, and so I thought, you know, it'd probably be career suicide to come back because I just think that oh, I couldn't do anything else. So I had to come back to Neighbours. Um, and, and my wife said, oh, no, you should do it. My agent obviously said, no, you should do it. And I was like, no, oh, I really don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. And I was talking to Alan and he said, Steph, you're mad. You're bloody stupid. He said, Neighbours is a fantastic gig. And I said, you think so? And he said, yeah, bloody oath it is. And he said, the other thing is, he said, you're only an actor if you're working. And I went, yeah, actually, you're right there. That's uh, and that was the thing that he said. And he said, he said, I think you're mad if you don't do it. It's, well, thank you, Alan Dale, because, yeah, Neighbours, yeah, I mean, yes. who knows what it would be like today if Paul hadn't yeah. come back. Um, another question as well is, uh, would you like to revisit um, the Clive, Susan Cole and Paul Love Triangle, which is going way back? Oh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's worth revisiting, um, even though we have Clive back on the show, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's great. Um, I, I, actually, I can't give it away, but I did some gorgeous scenes with, um, with Jeff and Annie the other day. It was just beautiful stuff. Was, I, don't, I don't get to, as you know, I don't get to do comedy very often. No, um, but just but, and whereas Jeff does, even though he plays this very serious COO of the Erinsborough uh, Hospital, he's still you know, he's still a, a, vaguely a comic character, and um, and it was just oh yeah, it was wonderful. But I, no, I think the Susan Clyde Paul triangle's long gone, and yeah, not not worth a revisit. It was a very feisty one. I got to speak to um, Jeff a few weeks ago for work actually, and he says he's always curious as to what made Clive switch from being the the guy who dressed in an ape suit to a CEO of a hospital, which is. Yeah, an interesting journey. With yeah. that um, yeah. A lot of people want to know um, sort of just your memories, really, kind of briefly of, of Anne Hattie. It's, she's the most requested people. Whenever we speak to somebody who worked with her, everybody always says, please ask about Anne Hattie. So, yeah, what memories do you have of Anne? Oh, Anne was gorgeous. Anne just, and I mean, it was funny because, because we worked so intimately together i'm talking about the whole cast the original cast because you've got to remember in the in the early days it was the original cast was only 12 people and yeah, yeah well, so we, you know we we did become very very tight as a cast and a, and a little community of actors together um and consequently because of it because it was such a, a an ongoing and demanding of your time gig um I, you know na neighbors i know it's it's said a lot of production uh, say this, you know, they say, oh, it's a, the little family, but it, it literally was a family because we were with each other, not 24 seven, but an awful lot of our time. Mm. Um, and so consequently, you know, I, I, 
Alan kind of did become a father figure and, and Anne definitely became a grandmother figure. Um, and I, yeah, I used to turn to Anne for all sorts of things and she helped me greatly with my, my skills as did Alan. Alan was the one that taught me to be still on, on, in front of a camera because I used to bounce around. He used to call me Tigger. He used to bounce around. <laughs> and he said, in a, in a close-up, he said, you just keep bouncing out of shots then. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, Anne was, Anne was great. She, she used to make me laugh, the, the funny things. I mean, the thing that used to make me laugh all the time was she used to get very, uh, she'd get put off very easily if somebody, if somebody was in her eye line. Oh, really? And that was always, and I used to always say, I, you're just making an excuse because you've forgotten your line, Anne. And she'd go, <laughs> no, 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 that person is in my eye line. That, I lost my concentration, that person. And I said, what do you mean that person's in your eye line? You know, they're standing over there in the dark. I said, what do you like when you're on stage and there's a whole freaking audience in your eye line? <laughs> yeah. exactly. But no, and- she was, Anne, was, Anne was great. I had, I had some great... Great talks with Anne and great times. And yeah, she's lovely. I'm very, very fond and, and lovely memories of Anne. He's a great dynamic. And Jim. Yeah, he was on the show as well, wasn't he? He, he, wasn't more he was on the show. show. I think he played, I think he played a, a, a he was in a relationship with Anne's character. Yeah, he played Reuben White, who married her and then died straight away afterwards. Um, the character. Yeah. Yeah. Which was fun. Um, and obviously this question was always going to come about. It's another one we've had. Have you had any talks with Jason Donovan or Guy Pierce about coming back? We, yeah, we do. We're always scheming. We're, we're trying to, uh, and, and uh, Annie Jones and myself and Guy are, uh, are trying to work on Jason. Jason, because and I, I don't know if Kylie would or not, but Jason's now, he's going, if, if, if Guy goes back, I'll go back. And Guy's going, well, if, he, if you go back, I'll go back. So we're at that stalemate. <laughs> So it's, it's everyone yeah, or no we're, one. We're still working. But it's, it's possibly a little bit easier now, of course, because Gemma's in the show. Well, that's it. Like, put the Jason pressure on Gemma to put yeah. the pressure on Jason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, and that's what I keep saying to her. I said, come on, you bloody well talk your dad into getting back here. Oh, I don't know. He might, we might talk him into it one day, a little, little guesty. It's, it would be fun. Um, listen, I should probably let you go. But as I say, any time if you ever want to relive Neighbours Memory Lane again, come on, because we've barely even got into any of this there's so much we could well we should make it we should make another time if you want that i'd absolutely love to so that was it we had an hour time limit on this one um and it literally went by in about two minutes is what it felt like um yeah so a lot we haven't covered but uh, as you heard he's coming back on so a lot we will cover soon i uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, keep an eye on the channel it's gone through another rebrand again um we can have more content coming probably not all of the time, but every now and then we'll get a few more videos out on top of these interviews as well. As I say, Lucinda Cowden coming soon and a couple of others that are in the pipeline as well that I'm pretty excited about. So I'm um, looking out for them. Uh, thank you for listening to this one. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you'll keep them well. Speak soon.